Okay, go. All right. Now we're all together, all joined. Hey, this is the Genesee County Compassion Club show. I'm your host, Jeremy, back in the studio here at allpointstv.com. Glad to be back in here. Definitely glad to be inside today. It is December 11th. And uh, I got John here in the studio with me, making it happen. Yeah, it's pretty cold out there, isn't it? It is real cold, uh, especially compared to 50 degrees on Monday. Yeah, I think that's probably the big reason why it feels so cold. I today. call Michigan the yo-yo state, up, so down, up, down. You're definitely up, down. yo-yoing. There is no doubt about it. Well, anyways, I'm glad to be back here in the studios. Uh, glad to be kicking it at the Genesee County Compassion Club. I'm glad you guys are there kicking it and making it happen. Medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, it's exploding right now. It is December 2019. We're headed into the next second decade of the century. And uh, man, I mean, things are changing, things are growing, things are happening. So let's get up to date. Let's get you guys up to speed with what's going on here with marijuana in Michigan. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type in on Facebook there or call into the show. The number is 810-250-7365. So uh, without further ado, let's kick it on. All right. Uh, first thing I want to do is let you guys know what's happening at the G. We got uh, the soup kitchen coming up. Of course, we always have that happening. No exception this month, especially during Christmas time. Uh, so we're glad to be a part of that. And we definitely could use your volunteerism if you're available. It is the uh, third Tuesday of the month and we serve lunch. So you guys should know about it by now. And uh, if you can help out this month, we definitely greatly appreciate it. All right. Uh, another great, wonderful thing that we have going down at the G. Uh, in regards to philanthropy is our pause for cause uh, we've been doing this every year and we're doing it this year as well I'm very excited where we help out the Genesee County Humane Society and uh, basically give the doggies and cats and whatever else they got we give them presents so we've got a big old tree set up in the club and um, what we'd like you to do is bring in any type of supplies of course we're looking for new items for the Humane Society so it could be you know dog food grooming items dog toys, uh, you name it. And not, not just dog stuff, could be cat stuff too. I'm not uh, exclusively a dog person. I do love cats as well. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, we have the tree set up. That's what it's for. So if you walk into the club and you see the Christmas tree and there's all these pet related items, that's what it's going to. And uh, if you want to help out, we would really appreciate it. Um, I know the animals appreciate it. On top of that, we also sponsor a couple cages every year at the Genesee County Humane Society. Uh, we did that back in the fall and I made mention of it here, but uh, I definitely want to bring that up again because, you know, that's pretty awesome. You guys at the G help sponsor cages at the Humane Society, which take care of that animal, whatever animal is in that cage through for an entire year. So all the food, the care, everything else that goes along with it, we sponsor that. You guys sponsor it. So thank you. And this pause for cause is in addition to that. So uh, help us decorate the tree, bring in your items and help us help out the animals in Genesee County. We're looking for collars, leashes, uh, food, like I mentioned, bedding, um, blankets, toys, cat litter, treats, cleaning supplies. Uh, they will take cash, of course, um, and any other items that might be helpful to the Humane Society. So uh, we make our collections all through the month of December, so you got plenty of time to do it. And believe it or not, the animals don't know when Christmas is. So they'll be getting their gifts at the beginning of the year. So plenty of time for you guys to help out and step up uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate it, all right? We love our furry friends. Another, uh, sorry about that. Another great thing that we do, and we were just able to get this approved last month, but uh, we were able to help out through one of the local churches in Genesee Township, provide holiday meals to over 50 families throughout Genesee County, and the families are identified through the the church and the local school systems. So we're looking specifically for families that uh, are in need during the holiday season. The church identifies them and you guys at the G have been able to help them monetarily uh, and get them some groceries. Essentially the church shows up at their doorstep with a bag of groceries and goodies so that they can have a wonderful holiday meal with their family and you guys basically make that happen. We've been doing that now for I want to say I don't know, maybe six, seven years, maybe longer. Um, it's kind of on the quiet side other than me mentioning it here on the show. But uh, I love it. I love the fact that these folks are getting fed. They don't know where it's coming from. They don't have a clue. It's like the, uh, you know, a stealthy Robin Hood, if you will. But um, you guys, that's you. You are the stealthy Robin Hoods. And I want to say thank you. So 
That's awesome. I'm so glad to be a part of that. Thank you very much. All right, I know that I know that the families appreciate it. All right, let's get on to the news here. We've got some uh, interesting things that have been happening. Of course, we've got recreational marijuana sales going on in the state now. It opened up December 1st to the surprise of a lot of folks. The the state was kind of preaching their timeline back earlier this year, stating that you know you wouldn't expect any type of recreational sales until 2020, and uh, they sort of surprised and got it rolled out. They allowed the transfer of the medical uh, inventories, if you will, at these approved facilities to be transferred into a recreational inventory, uh, which is really kind of like a push of the button sort of a thing, but they allowed it. And consequently, it has allowed for the recreational supply to exist. I mean, uh, if you will, there's no difference between a medical plant and a recreational plant. A plant's a plant. But obviously, if I just told you yesterday you can start growing one, you ought to know that you're not going to have anything usable for months, months and months and months. It could be even like six to eight months, just depending on how long it takes for you to grow said plant. So at any rate, obviously with recreational sales coming online, there needed to be product on the shelf and the state allowed these places to transfer their inventory from one side to the other. Consequently, boom, here we go. Opening day, December 1st, uh, we had four different places open up in Michigan. Uh, I believe three of the four actually were able to be open and uh, record sales, of course, I don't know why they would say record sales. It's their first day of sales. I don't know what kind of record you're talking about. But anyways, uh, they had some pretty profound sales, uh, lines around the block kind of a thing. They saw numerous reports and papers, quite a few of the patrons uh, that chose to be a part of that first day. Congratulations to them, but I also noticed that you were from out of state, so which is a good thing. I'm glad we're bringing people into Michigan for our recreational market. That's cool. Um, I've heard obviously reports from Ohio State Police that you know they're looking out for people bringing stuff back uh, or trying to do things dirty, black market, whatever you want to call it. So there is that concern. Um, and in addition to that, I think we also have to realize that things are changing. I mean all around us, not just here in Michigan, Ohio, you know, they have their changes. Illinois is set to roll out recreational cannabis here at the first of the year. Um, so, I mean, Michigan's not gonna be the only dot on the map for very long, but we are for now, and it certainly is impacting these businesses. Now, as you can see, all of the places that have been so far licensed for recreational sales have previously been medical facilities that have been licensed through the MMFLA of 2016. So the state gave those facilities a jump start, said you are the only ones who can apply for a rec license at this point, and they are the only ones doing so. So opening day, like I said, four places licensed, three actually open, and since then they've actually opened and licensed a few more around the state, with many more expected to come online here in the near future. Um, this is, I mean, it's a good thing. We're, we're seeing, let me get you some of the numbers here if I can actually find them. Uh, I think they had a reported revenue uh, for the state and tax sales collections of almost over, just close to a quarter of a million dollars in their first couple days alone. I think the number was like $223,000 in sales tax or in tax. I shouldn't just say sales tax because there's also an excise tax that's applied in addition to the sales tax for these recreational consumers. Um, but at any rate, yeah, $223,000 uh, collected so far in a very short period of time. Um, how does that compare? I guess it sounds like a lot of money because $223,000, that is a lot of money. There's no doubt about it. Um, but in comparison and you know, as far as the state's concerns and needs, it's, it's hardly a drop in the bucket. I'll give you this as an example. Um, two months ago, we covered this on the podcast, the state allocated 50 plus million dollars, 50 plus million dollars just to administer this marijuana program here in the state. And I'm talking about medical and recreational. And between the additional staff, the additional, uh, whether it be staff at Lara, staff at MRA, staff at the tobacco division, uh, additional police officers, administrative, bureauc bureaucratic staff, you name it, um, $50 million is basically the sum of those. And you can verify that for yourself, just look it up. But uh, yeah, if the state collected 223,000 and they already spent 50 million, well, they're a long ways away from recapturing what they've already committed to. And the comments about using the cannabis revenue tax streams to fix our roads, um, you're gonna need a lot more sales to have an impact in that regard. So let's be realistic when we talk about this and let's remind ourselves 
what we're actually dealing with. And I think one of the big things that we need to consider and address in the coming future is the tax generation, uh, meaning specifically the amount that the state is charging for their fees. I feel that they are um, excessive, to say the least. And uh, the amount of money that the state's allocating to administer this program, also incredibly excessive, uh, to say the least. Leave it to a bureaucrat to actually find something that they can tax. They have no skin in the game other than giving you the permission and give, at, a, at a great price to do that. And they're still gonna find themselves in the hole. Yeah, well, yeah that just leads it to the government types. You're right, John. And this is the price that Michiganders, for the most part, are going to pay. Because, frankly, you asked for it. You said tax and regulate us. You asked for this. Um, so if you are that recreational consumer and you feel like going to the new dispensary that just got licensed and paying, uh, you know, exorbitant prices for your for your recreational cannabis, you asked for it. I mean, the, the cost of doing business in the recreational market and in the uh, licensed facilities medical market, it's high. I mean, these fees are incredibly high. Uh, the government has their digs in and, and they got them in deep. So consequently, that's part of the reason why you're seeing the incredibly high priced materials. Uh, and not only that, but obviously you also have to understand that most of these businesses were investment businesses. In other words, people who aren't necessarily getting their hands dirty, putting up the money to collect the money, if you will, on these businesses. And when you have that, you have folks that just simply are waiting at the end of the day for a paycheck because they invested in your business to get it started, obviously it's cutting down on the overall margins. I mean, if, if, if there's only $5 coming in from a product and you know, you've spent every one of those dollars just to get it out the door, well, you didn't make money. And, and these guys aren't dummies. They didn't get to have these million dollar investments because they were stupid or because they, they don't know how to handle money. And so that's another reason why you're seeing these high prices at these dispensaries is because there has to be enough margin in there for them to get paid too, on top of the exorbitant state fees, local fees, taxes, insurances. I mean, you name it, it goes on and on and on. And everybody in this business is asking right now for a premium because they can, because they feel that it's justified, because they are the entrepreneurs themselves and they should be rewarded for their entrepreneurialship. Um, and honestly, that's that's really what's going on here. And I've seen it in the eyes of countless businessmen that believe that they are somehow going on the edge and investing in the medical or in the recreational marijuana markets and that they should be rewarded for doing so. Um, but this this market is really no different than any other market out there. It's controlled by the same factors that any other product is. And, uh, and there may be even more factors that contribute to the controlling overall nature of this economy. Um, what are we going to see in the future? Look to the other states. Look to Colorado. Look to these places where they have had time for markets to swell, boom, bust, reset, and they're still going through this process. Uh, and that's what we're going to see here in Michigan. Um, so it, it, right now, yeah, prices are high for rec. Uh, you ask for it and you get what you ask for sometimes. So there you go. As far as for medical goes, um, and really not much has changed. I, I have heard a number of people being impacted by the recreational market who are medical patients who have said, look, I went to the dispensary and they didn't have anything. Now, of course, this is a rare case because there's only been a few dispensaries that have even been licensed and able to sell recreationally uh, and I don't know that they, if that's really true. I, I gotta honestly believe it's more of a rumor, um, but maybe it isn't. And I know that the state put limits on the amount that the holders were able to transfer from medical to recreational. So I don't know that you could do more than 50%. I heard that that was the number. Maybe things changed. But at any rate, there hasn't been a big impact to the medical market, other than some folks are saying now, because the recreational prices are so high, that the medical producers are feeling justified in being able to charge more for their product. Um, I don't think this is right. I mean, personally, I have never agreed to this type of uh, mentality when it comes to economy. And I think that people should sell something for what it's worth, uh, that that worth should be decided by the cost that was put into pr its production. Um, 
and not necessarily what the market dictates what its value is. All right, so I'll give you an example that's unrelated. Diamonds would be a good example. Right now, you cannot buy a diamond that is not incredibly overpriced in comparison to the cost that it took to produce that diamond and put it in front of you. Uh, the cost to put it in front of you is dollars, literally dollars. And when I say dollars, I mean like singles, okay? But you're paying thousands for this rock because of a perceived market value. And it, we're doing the same thing to cannabis, at least some people are, because they perceive its value to be higher than what it really is. And what will ultimately determine that fact is the economy, just like it always does. And I think that, you know, you could say, well, Jeremy, the diamonds example that you just gave is a perfect example of when that economy doesn't work. And it doesn't work because it was monopolized, and most of you understand that. Cannabis is not going to be monopolized. There's not one place on earth where we find cannabis. We find cannabis where we put it. And we produce cannabis when we decide to produce it. So that does impact its economy of scale and it will ultimately impact its pricing in the long run. Um, I read a comment on one of these posts uh, the other day and it said, be careful what you wish for. For those of you that are asking for $5 grams or less, who would like to see prices similar to what they have out in Oregon in the harvest time. Be careful what you ask for because the only people that are gonna be able to produce that are large scale mega millionaire mega grows. Okay, economies of scale if you will. That's the only way to be able to produce high quality meds at low, low quality prices. And the quality honestly at that point is gonna be debatable. I mean, how many people talk about the quality of a Philip Morris product. When's the last time you heard somebody say, man, this Winston is incredibly good. That's exactly what, and that's like, another parallel, uh, parallel I see too, is like a, right after prohibition is repealed, there's a lot of, there's a lot of beer, comp every, almost every small town of a sizable population had a brewery or two, Flint included. We had White Seal up on South Saginaw. Sure. But as they got, as they basically, they their marketplace kind of, they're just in local, they didn't expand, they're either brought out or just faded, they either bought out by other corporations and they just kind of put their brand along with them and, you know, and basically become blurred or they just Simply went out of business, yeah. and so that's what's. I think that's what's going to happen. You're going to have major producers of marijuana, and the other local ones, and the people who would actually produce produce a quality product, would be like fading out because they simply couldn't keep up with marketing and distribution that the other corporations are, go, are going to be able to do it. That's yeah. why I see it. And I, I think that this is. Uh, you, I think you're going to see some of that, John. I couldn't agree more. But I also think that in a way our economy here in the United States has evolved a little bit, if you will, and there is an understanding by few, and I think that understanding is growing, and what I'm getting to is that people are starting to realize the whole buy local, grow local, whatever you want to call it, small business, you know, how do you support properly, so on. It's starting to catch on. People are starting to understand that, well, if I continue to purchase everything that I buy from a big box store, then there won't be any small time businesses around. There won't be my opportunity to be a small business owner, so on and so forth. And we also understand now through experience, and we've had you know 50 years of mass production in this country, that the mass produced items aren't always the best quality things. Sometimes it's good, like nobody wants a handcrafted microwave. All right, I understand that. But sometimes we do want handcrafted items, whether it be a cigar, uh, a, a necktie, uh, you know, whatever it may be, and you're willing to pay the premium to have that quality put into that item. I think cannabis is going to be one of those types of items where people will specifically search for that level of quality, like you see in wine. And, and not to say that you're not going to find the, the $3 bottle of wine, because you do, or you're not to say that you're not going to find the, uh, the, the $5 gram. You're going to but you're gonna get what you pay for in the future. And I think that that's always been the case, always will be the case. And I'm hoping that this evolution that I mentioned of our economy here in the States will have an impact on our industry in the sense that you might not have the giant fallout like, well, the that you have had in other industries. Like, you might have, right from the get-go, 
more artisan craft type micro small micro businesses. breweries and yes. smaller smaller bakeries now too exactly. smaller bakeries like craft, in, in, in the craft 1980s bar. you couldn't find a micro brewery right John I mean you, you, they weren't really around everybody was drinking Miller Lite and Coors and Budweiser and we we're all happy with it and the guys who did want something different had to make it themselves in their basement you know what I mean and and it's not that people weren't out there who enjoyed craft beer they were it's just that it wasn't marketed to them it wasn't produced it wasn't readily available and I don't see that happening with cannabis because we already have that available. It's been available from the get-go, from the inception of legalization. It, people know it's there. And so you're going to have those consumers that are going to only search for that. There's going to be consumers who will occasionally search for it, and then there'll be the ones who never do. They just want the bo bottom line, box store, weed, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's what I'm trying to get at, John, is that I think they're going to see, hopefully see, less of a fallout, less of a boom boost sort of uh, bubble bursting economy, and, and hopefully maybe a little bit more of a settled one. But um, we'll have to see. I mean, it, it, like I said, be careful what you wish for, folks. If you, if you really want to have you know, cheap weed and, and that's all you really care about, you'll get it. Um, you'll, you'll definitely get it. But uh, just because something's, on the other hand, what I guess I should say is that just because something's expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Uh, and that's something else to understand as well. And I have heard some horror stories of uh, dispensaries where you know, the only thing they care about is the THC content. And that really is ultimately determining their price points, which is certainly a factor. Not to say that it isn't, but anybody who's a connoisseur of cannabis understands that there's more going into that than just the cannabinoids and that the terpenes provide an equally pleasurable experience as well and should be equally weighed in, in uh, engaging its value, if you will. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be a, an educational curve that's going to go along with this, an ec economical one as well. And, um, yeah, I guess, it, it, yeah, I, mean, I think we need to keep things in scale as well. So what I mean by that is, is you know, people talk about, oh, well, the state's first week of marijuana sales is in the you know so many million dollars blah 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 uh y'all need to look at the alcohol sales in michigan and see what the numbers look like for that um i, I read a report just the other day that said the amount of alcohol sales that occur in our state equivalent or are equivalent to every adult drinking eight drinks a week and that is profound. I'm not a big drinker. I'm not, I'm not a, a abolitionist by any means. I like to have a drink, but I'm not a drinker. And I don't know that I've ever, I mean, eight drinks a week to me is a lot. I don't mean to, I'm not trying to condemn anybody out there. If, if you have a couple of drinks a day, every day, more power to you. I don't care. I mean, most people in Europe have a glass of wine with every meal except breakfast. I'm just saying eight drinks a week per person, it sounds like a lot. And uh, if you compare that to cannabis sales, I mean, cannabis sales don't even compare. They're not even close. So, and again, yeah, we only have three or four places that are even open and ready to sell. So I understand it's not a fair comparison, and maybe we'll have a more accurate comparison in five years. Um, but at any rate, right now, let's not start thinking that marijuana is going to change the world or pave your roads with gold, because it's a long ways away from that. Okay, right. I'm gonna ask you a question here. This is speculation. If you want to just ignore it and go on, I just I can understand. But okay, you go to you can go to a mom and pop place and plop down money for cigarettes and beer, right? You know, if they, okay. If you have a mom and pop place opening, up, have a you know the sales here, and they want to sell marijuana, they are allowed to sell it. They go through the license procedure, and allowed to sell it. Uh, do you see it's gonna? Do you think they're gonna gravitate towards maybe getting a, like the major big box producer, like you know, like akin to like Budweiser or Anheuser Busch or whatever producer of it, or do you think they're gonna try to stay with the local, you know, the local produced stuff? Uh, no, I think John, they are absolutely gonna be see. You will be seeing national brands. Absolutely, the the biggest contributing factor to that not already occurring is the fact that the federal government still deems it illegal. Uh, you're not allowed to bank. You're not allowed to you know do anything with marijuana. And I think that is the number one factor that is why you haven't seen Marlboro weed or, or something to that, to that fact. I think you absolutely will see that. And, uh, part of what I wanted to mention today is um, if you increase in stock prices in your major cannabis stocks out there, they're incredibly low right now. Uh, the market is not good for cannabis stocks. 
It's good if you want to buy because they're incredibly low. Um, does that mean they're going to go up? Well, I don't know. They might go up. They might continue to slide down. Um, but brands like Canopy and Aurora, they are owned by major, major companies that will absolutely be ready and willing to do national rollouts the second that they get the okay to do so. So, um, yeah, I think you're still going to have artisan craft. I, I don't I don't think that's going to ever not be a part of it. But I think you absolutely will have big box weed. And the hard part for a lot of these businesses in Michigan will be competing against that in, say, you know, 10 years down the road. When Marlboro is able to put out a pack of cannabis cigarettes, if you will, for, say, 10 bucks or whatever it may be at that point, um, are these local places that we see like right now getting licenses, paying these incredibly high fees, um, having all this administrative and bureaucratic items to go through, are they going to be able to play ball on the same level that these other giants will be? And the answer is no. <laughs> There's no chance. And that's what I was talking about before, where if you want a $5 gram, be careful what you wish for, because that's how it's going to get to you. It's not going to be because somebody did it out of the goodness of their heart or because somebody wanted to really give you the best deal in the world. It's going to be because Marlboro can make a profit at five bucks a gram, and that's all there is to it. So careful what you wish for. Um, moving on here, the saliva test, roadside testing for marijuana. Obviously, this is getting to be a bigger and bigger deal. I had to laugh at the article that came out on MLive uh, the day that we opened up recreational sales here in Michigan because you know, on, on the one headline it said, you know, rec sales open, lines are on the block, blah, 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 great stuff. The very next article was Michigan State Police busting some guy. Uh, actually, I think the guy ran into a police officer, if I'm not mistaken. You can pull this up on MLive. Car accident, guy runs into somebody else. And the first thing the police say, and this is in the headline, is that you know driver was under the influence of marijuana. Um, it, I, I laughed because to me it's utter, total, complete, 100% propaganda because I'm reading this headline at like, I don't know, noon on the day that they legalized sales. So you're telling me that this guy went, bought his weed, got high, got in a car accident, and then got it reported on by noon. On the same day that he, no, come on. You know, obviously this is a propaganda story put out by MLive through the state police just to remind everybody that high driving is not okay. And I wish they would have just said that instead of making up some BS story and, you know, this stuff just irks me. Just be real. Just be real. What's wrong with saying, look, don't get high and drive. Don't be distracted and drive. Why do I have to have some BS story I made up to reiterate my point. Um, but anyways, they did, I laughed, we move on. Don't get high and drive. This, the saliva test, the reason I'm talking about it. Uh, handheld device, this is a, a product, Sotac, Sotoxa, excuse me. S-O, capital T-O, X-A. It's the company that uh, provides the device. Uh, police are already using it. Um, It's actually, they were highlighting it today in the Capitol uh, as a part of Michigan December, Michigan's National Impaired Driving Prevention Month. Um, and then they uh, honored the Lieutenant, I'm sorry, the Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist and Senator Peter McGregor and a victim's advocate, Brian Swift, were honored for their efforts to help Michigan become one of the first states to implement this highway safety reform. So um, we talked a little bit about this on the other podcast. Uh, the test results on this are not exactly 100%. In fact, they're not even close to being 100%. Um, you do have the right to refuse the test. That is uh, your right, and you will have some sort of fine or penalty for doing so. Um, you know, I, like I've said before, I'm not an attorney. I'm not telling you what to do. Talk to an attorney. Let them tell you what to do. But at any rate, what I'm telling you to do is don't get high and drive. <laughs> it's real simple. Don't get high and drive. Uh, don't have stuff that's accessible in your car. All right? If you're rolling around with a roach in the cup holder, because nobody has ashtrays anymore, but uh, that's not a good idea. It's accessible, obviously. Don't care if you were using it or not. It's accessible. 
and if you get pulled over, you're probably going to get penalized for it. Don't don't do that. Just put it somewhere else. Treat it like an open can of beer, which you would never have in your car, right? Um, you'll be fine. All right, moving on here. Virginia, probably in my in my guess, and I, I talked about this on one of the podcasts. I think last summer. I still have it out there. What is going? Who is going to be the last state in the union to legalize cannabis? Who's going to be last? Uh, Virginia might be on that list, but they're taking steps to get off the list, if you will. Um, there's an article here I was just checking out. Looks like uh, Virginia may be looking at potentially uh, marijuana. Let me pull this up here. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Okay. It says here that uh, Virginia Democratic leaders will push next year for decrim of marijuana possession and wiping clean the records of thousands of people that were convicted, blah, 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 blah. So uh, a marginal step forward. Decrim is certainly better than nothing, um, but uh, that's not any type of legalization. That's for sure. So, all right, moving on here. Uh, I mentioned Illinois, they're rolling out. I think part of the reason that we, Michigan, if you will, decided to roll out rec sales December 1st, the way they did is because of Illinois. Illinois is rolling out their rec program January 1st. And uh, I think that Michigan was trying to beat them to the punch. Honestly, I think they were, uh, and we did. So good for Michigan in that regard, that's, that's cool. Um, I, was, I did talk a little bit about pot stocks today earlier. Uh, one of those things, I guess I want to go back to that for just a second and talk about some of the factors involved in the reasons why we're seeing low prices right now for pot stocks. And uh, one of those things that easily can be pointed to is the vape market. Uh, as you know, obviously big issue with vapes, uh, specifically the vitamin E acetate that's been found in the majority of these cartridges. Uh, is never meant to be combusted, or certainly not inhaled, and um, is really the culprit behind the scare. Not the vapes themselves, not the, not the material, whether it be nicotine or cannabis in this case. That's not the problem. The problem is the, the material holding it, if you will, the embodied material holding the liquid uh, and becoming carcinogenic, if you will, in your lungs. So clearly a, a problem. All of the vape products nationwide that were, you know, legit, if you will, we're not talking about black market, of course, but uh, all of those products were pulled, at least for retesting, uh, at the very minimum. So, right there, there's a big impact to these stock prices, if you will. Another big impact to them is the Safe Banking Act. Many people felt that that was going to go through. Uh, it still has yet to go through. It still has yet to be, become a law. Um, just because something passes committee does not mean it's a bill. Or do, I'm sorry, it does not mean it's going to become a law. It's, it's just a bill at that point, and it's got a long ways to go. So we do have a long ways to go nationally. Uh, we need a rescheduling of marijuana, 100%. We need laws to protect consumers, producers, and bankers of this product. And until those happen, we are at a, we're at a, a, a roadblock. All right, uh, these companies, they really are, they can't do interstate commerce. I mean, there's all kinds of problems in trying to have a national brand or, or a large corporate uh, scheme go on that involves, in some cases, even multinational laws. All right, uh, big, it's a big is issue to deal with. So until that happens, until these things are addressed, you're not gonna probably see these stocks climb back up. And, and in my personal, opinion. I don't think you're going to see a big bubble, if you will, like we saw with tech stocks years ago and so on. Uh, we already had a bubble in cannabis stocks. If you didn't know about that, it, it went up and came back down. We're, we're at that low point now. So if you want to try to ride this wave, this is probably the best time that you're going to have to get on the wave. How big it's going to grow, <clears throat> I would predict it's going to reach its peak within about a 60-day period of when we finally do something on a federal national level, whatever that is, whatever that is, just the media hoopla alone around that will drive the prices up probably to their max points. Um, 
and then we'll probably be seeing them slide back down. And, and the reason I say that is because this is normal business, all right? And the, all of these startup companies that you've been seeing and talking and hearing about in the news uh, nationally and internationally for that matter, those are still startups. And what you'll probably see is them gain, come back down, and then get bought out. Um, and most likely that's probably what will happen. So if you like to play in that market, now might be the best time for you to get in. Um, you could still lose, obviously. If you, if you play the game, you ought to know that. So, all right, I want to talk about one more thing here before we wrap up the show today. Uh, yesterday, obviously, you guys probably, most of you heard about it. There was a couple uh, raids, if you will, conducted by the Michigan State Police, the Marijuana Regulatory Agency Division of Marijuana and Tobacco, uh, which is a brand new division, really, um, that was part of that $50 million I mentioned earlier on the show. So yes, it's being put to use by the state and they are out there enforcing the laws. Essentially, these two places were being accused of uh, allegedly selling recreational cannabis to anybody and everyone um, without a license to do so. And in the article addressed in M Live, I thought it was kind of telling what the Michigan State Police officer had to say. And he said that they specifically were going after these folks who did not have a license to do so and who did not have their material tested and who had obtained their cannabis from the black market. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting, dubbing any cannabis that is not through their regulated regulatory system as black market weed. Um, you know, when I was growing up and I heard about the black market, I think probably the first time I ever heard about that was watching like Mutual of Omaha or you know National Geographic, something like that, where they were talking about bringing in illegal ivory, I think is what it was. You know, tusk from elephants or skins from large cats and that type of thing. And, and so I, I got this impression of the black market as being this incredibly evil thing, which for the most part, that could be absolutely true. Uh, you know, dealing in something that should have never been done, selling it to people who should never spend their money on such an evil thing. Um, just pure diabolical evil. And yeah, I think if you're out there killing animals for no good reason, just so you can hang it on your wall, that's evil. Um, and and that's, that's where I, as a child, kind of got my understanding of what the black market is. And now we sort of have this uh, evolved definition, if you will, of the black market and now it, it's sort of included because of the drug war and so on and so forth over the past 30 years a, a lot more than just illegal poachers out there pilfering and selling their their wares now we're talking about the drug war and everything else and so this black market term is being applied to anything that's outside of the regulatory norm uh, and, and I don't know that it's being fairly applied I guess is what I'm getting to um, I'm not trying to say that people who are selling recreational cannabis without a license are okay. Um, obviously, you know, I drive a car just like everybody else and I realize that I have to maintain the speed limit. There's rules in place to keep people safe and, and to conduct society in the manner that we deem fit. Um, but that being said, I think we also have to look at the whole picture in general and realize that we could potentially, as a society here in Michigan, be putting folks in jail, think about that, putting them in jail, simply because they didn't pay enough money to the state to have a license. And I can think specifically of an example that I've talked about on this show in the past, is Danny Trevino. Danny Trevino is sitting in prison right now, federal prison, serving out a 10 to 11 year term, because he wanted to do exactly what these licensed businesses are doing. And he did so without getting a license and now he's paying the price for not getting that license and doing so anyways. Um, I think this is a problem that we have to address. It does not make sense as a society to take someone who refused to pay their fee, incarcerate them, and then force me to pay their expense for living because they didn't pay their fee. It does not make sense. It does not make sense as a, as a taxpayer, as a business person, as a dude with a calculator in his hands. It doesn't make sense. 
Okay, uh, it, it is a. It takes. I, I understand you have to pay to play. I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is the the penalty does not fit the crime, and we have to address this. We have to address this. And I want to point out something else that most people haven't thought about. And I did see a post from I believe his name is uh, Joe Brown. He's one of the first hemp licensed hemp farmers in Michigan. And he posted out something that I thought was very eye-opening, and most of you probably haven't thought about this. The hemp law, the U.S. hemp law, the, 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 the changes in the farm bill, so on and so forth, that allow this proliferation of hemp products throughout the U.S. is predicated on the fact that these plants cannot have more than 3%, 0.3% THC in their cannabinoid content profile. We all understand that. I think we've all taken that as sort of like the standard. We, we get it, right? What we've failed to realize is that when you have a garden that accidentally produces 0 0.04, okay, so it produces just a little bit too much THC, that, that is no longer by law even considered hemp. And now by law, that farmer is no longer just over his limit. He is a drug felon, warlord, if you will, maintaining and operating a drug house along with a whole bunch of other crimes that can be easily thrown against them because they simply were over their limit. So this is another example of overregulation without having any type of foresight or hindsight, if you will, to realize that, okay, well, what do you do with somebody who's just over the limit, all right? And I've used this analogy before and I'll do it again. If I'm driving down the road and the speed limit's 55 and I'm doing 60, there's a, there's a penalty that's assessed for that, right? And, and the penalty will grow the faster I was going over the speed limit, all the way up into taking my car away from me and putting me in jail. Now, if I'm five miles an hour over, is that gonna happen? No. They're gonna give me a ticket. It's probably gonna be around 150 bucks or less. I might have to pay a little bit more in my insurance. I'm gonna get slapped on the hand. I understand that. And I don't think anybody's disputing the fact that if you break the law, you should be punished. What I'm saying is the punishment needs to fit the crime. And we have done that throughout our society and throughout all of our different laws that we've created, but yet we've failed to realize the implications of these laws that we have on the books now with regards to marijuana. It does not make sense to take somebody and say, okay, well, if you do it this way, you're perfectly fine. But if you take one step to the left, you are a felon. You need to have everything you own confiscated and you need to be incarcerated. It just makes no sense. So we need to have adjustment in this area. We need to have addressment in this area. And I don't know if that addressment should come legislatively or from our law enforcement or from our correction facilities. Um, somebody needs to speak up and address this because it doesn't make sense. And these places yesterday in Flint that were busted or raided for uh, operating without a license, well, they need to go get a license. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, you have to follow the rules. Nobody's saying you shouldn't have to follow the rules. The problem is, is what happens when somebody's outside of the rules? Do we really, as a society, want to make them a felon? Want to go from, you know, someone who's considered, hey, an entrepreneur, they're out there trying to start a new business, we award them, we applaud them, as an American, go get it. But yet, wait a minute, you went a little too fast. So you're not an American anymore, you are now the curmudgeon of society, and we don't ever want to see your face again. That's a pretty hard line there. It's something that we need to take care of and we need to address. And again, going back to the officer's comments on this, you know, he said basically, look, they didn't pay their fee. Other places did pay their fee. It's not fair to the places that did pay their fee uh, in comparison to places that don't and just do whatever they want. So I can understand the sentiment that the officer brings to the table and then his side of the story. I can understand that. I can also understand the other side of the story that says, well, these people didn't have enough money to be able to pay that fee. These people, maybe they could have paid the fee, but they weren't allowed to. Maybe there's other extenuating circumstances that we don't know about that resulted in the fact that they were not able to pay this fee. 
And, and this goes back to what I was talking about before, where the fees that our government has established for this are exorbitant. They're incredibly high. And in fact, there was an article just in the paper the other day about how minorities feel that they have been cut out of Michigan's marijuana market. And the truth of the fact is, that is absolutely correct. But what I would also add to that is it has nothing to do with the fact that you are a minority. It has everything to do with the fact that you don't have enough money. All right? That's, that's what it's about. It's about money. And, and because we've set such a high bar on what it takes to get into this industry here in Michigan, there's a lot of people that are going to get cut out, that have been cut out. And so I ask this officer who talks about the fairness of these people being able to compete or not compete, where is the fairness for those people? Where is the fairness for these people who can't afford to pay those fees? You know, I, I think that we live in this democratic society of America on the impetus that we have the opportunity to make something of ourselves. That you can come here with nothing and, and build your kingdom, if you will. That's been the mantra of America for a long time. But yet now, we've entered into this new regulatory age where in the name of safety, we create monopolies. That's what we're doing. We're creating corridors that certain people can go down and nobody else can. And, and so where is the fairness in that? And that's something that we're going to have to address. It's something that's going to continue to go on because you're not going to have people who are being starved be told that they can't have a way to make a means for themselves when they have one right in front of them. When they see that somebody else on the street corner is doing the same thing and they're able to provide for their family and you're telling them that you can't, you can't play the game. That's essentially what you're telling them. That is a problem. And if you don't believe me, look at California. Look at some of the other places that have tried to over-regulate the system and they, what do they get? They get blowback. They get black market like that police officer was talking about because that's exactly what happens. Your economy will control your product. 100%, it always does, always will. And so we need to have this understanding. Our state needs to recognize that. And there has to be some changes made in the future. There's gonna to have to be some changes made. Um, I guess the other thing I would point out, and I'll probably, I'll wrap up the show with this, been going on for a minute. Now that you guys understand the pricing, now that you understand the implications of the fees in the program, now that you know what that actually adds up to, doesn't it make sense now to go get your patient card after the state has just went and lowered the fees? After years ago, they extended the program from 12 to 2 years. After now you know you don't have to pay an excess tax. You don't have to pay a sales tax. You can have a caregiver provide specifically for you. Doesn't it make sense now to go get your patient card? How long is it going to be? How many dollars will you spend at your dispensary in additional fees and taxes and overpriced meds? How many times are you going to do that before you go spend your 40 bucks to the state and get your patient card? Think about it. Spread the word. Tell your friends, look, you want to save a buck? Go get your patient card. Go get a caregiver. You can get better quality meds at a cheaper price. And in addition to all of these things, you also get an added layer of protection. And now I'm starting to sound like the sham wow uh, salesperson, but I'm telling you, the patient card adds a layer of patient protection. And what do I mean by that? Michigan has a zero tolerance law. That means if you get pulled over, you don't have a patient card, but you've got marijuana in your system, you can be charged with operating under the influence by law. If you have a patient card, you have an exception built in there. It doesn't mean that you get to drive impaired. That's not what I'm implying. But it allows you to have cannabis in your system and still be operating the vehicle legally. So that right there is worth 40 bucks protection, if you ask me. But um, at any rate, think about it, okay? 40 bucks. That's what it costs to be a patient. Most doctors now are charging you know, under $100 to do your... Uh, certification and follow-up appointment. Um, like I said, it's good for two years. Like I said, you don't pay sales tax, you don't pay excise tax, and you're probably gonna get a better quality product for a lower price in the first place. So be a patient, become a patient, all right? We've expanded the qualifying conditions list, I think three times now. There's a plethora of things that you can qualify for for medical marijuana. 
Um, and that's definitely something that I would advocate that you look into. All right. So, all right. That's the show for today. I appreciate you being with me. Thank you for coming, listening. Get down to the G. All right, you guys, bring some stuff for the pets. We love helping out our humane society furry friends. Um, and stay safe out there, all right? Have a good Christmas season. Be careful on those roads. Smoke a fat one. Enjoy it once you get home, all right? Enjoy the holidays. Love you guys. Merry Christmas. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Stay warm. Be safe, all right? Peace. Genesee County Compassion Club. Get there, all right? We're safe. All right, see you.